Hey guys, welcome. So if you're watching this, just move this over here. If you're watching this video, then that means you're about to start Earth and Wine Rental Science for the very first time. Welcome. Now, my name is Mr. Forrest, as you know, and I teach Earth and Environmental Science here at our school, Murrumbidgee Regional High School in Griffith, New South Wales. And these sets of videos are designed to help you if you're struggling a little bit with EES and you want to get another perspective. So please ensure that when you watch these videos, you pause it to make notes or you replay it again if you have questions and you ask your EES teacher. If anything that I say is incorrect, feel free to leave something in the comments with a correction and an explanation. Okay, so let's get started with module one. So here we have a series of inquiry questions at the end of each topic. If you feel comfortable with the topic and you think you know what you know, then by all means have a crack at the questions that are found at the end of each one. This is a summary of the first four that are going to be in year 11. Okay, so if you need to, go back over it and have a crack at them. Now our first topic here is Earth's resources. So we have to start with how did the Earth begin in the first place? So originally, our planet is essentially a miracle floating in space. Okay, our planet was just the right distance away from the sun that it had enough energy to start metabolic processes for life, but not too far away that it started to freeze over or too close it started to burn. So this is what we call a Goldilocks zone, a unique range of temperature, pH, pressure and other physical factors that allows life to survive. When we're looking for planets in other solar systems, we tend to look for any planet that first of all falls within the Goldilocks zone. From there, we can start to establish, okay, how hot is it? How much air pressure is there? What's the pH like? Now, the current theory that we have about our planet forming is what we call the planetismal accretion theory. In essence, we had rocks just floating around in space. Now, every object in the universe actually has a very small gravitational field that's just not noticeable on Earth or any planet, really, because the bigger the mass, or the more mass there is, the more gravity that object tends to exert. So imagine that you have a rock about the size of this pen floating in space. And naturally, it's not going to attract a giant asteroid towards it. I mean, it doesn't have enough mass to it. However, it might attract something smaller. They clump together, and over a couple of centuries, they might fuse. Now with metals in space, they actually have a form called cold welding, whereby any form of metallic object in space will naturally fuse together. Astronauts use this constantly to make repairs. So if we had large amounts of iron ore floating around in space, or any sort of metal, they would naturally fuse together when they come in physical contact, meaning that an object will continue to grow and grow and grow, and as such gains more mass and pulls more stuff in. Now, as we know, our planet has approximately four or five different spheres. You may cover them in year nine and ten, you know, the biosphere, lithosphere, hydrosphere, and atmosphere. But in geology and earth environmental science, we tend to look at them more as a geosphere, which is another name for the lithosphere, our biosphere, hydrosphere, atmosphere, which is on this list, and cryosphere, which is essentially our planet's air conditioning. It's how it keeps itself cool. When people talk about global warming and the hole in the ozone layer, this is a sphere that tends to suffer quite a fair bit, but we're going to cover that in later topics. Now, here is a timeline of our planet. So around about 4.56 billion years ago, the sun formed as a condensing nebula. So originally it was just a large cloud of superheated gas, then it condensed, started to catch and release huge amounts of energy and became an actual full-fledged star. Around about 4.4 billion years ago, the Earth began to solidify as a single mass. So as it compressed upon itself, it started to get very hot in the center. So it started to radiate heat outwards. For this, it started to melt the iron ore and other materials there in the center, forming magma. So as such, the heavier stuff went towards the center, the lighter stuff went towards the outside. If you've ever watched a washing machine going, like a, a front loader, you know that the clothes get stuck around the outside as it spins, and any water that's there gets flung outwards through the tiny holes, 
leaving the relatively damp clothes still inside the washing machine. Same concept. All right, now as such, the lighter materials here are what we call silicates. So it's anything that involves silicon like sand. That's silicon dioxide. Around about 4.4 to 4 billion years ago, the crust of the mantle oh, pardon me, began to solidify with cooling surface, forming solid matter rather than exposed magma. So like if you leave soup out for too long, it forms a skin on the top, whereas underneath it's still you know quite warm. Same concept. Four billion years ago, the crust became a feature on Earth's surface, and surface temperature dropped below boiling point of water. So that's really good because it enabled liquid water to actually cool down and condense on the surface, forming the very first rivers and oceans and lakes and such. Now, 0.2 billion years later, the earliest signs of life began to occur. So as such, the three abiotic spheres, so spheres that didn't have any living things in it, like lithosphere, bio, not lithosphere, hydrosphere, and atmosphere, became established. They became a permanent fixture in our planet. Now, in the image to the right, you can see the composition of our planet. Now, 35% of our planet is actually made out of iron. 28% is made out of oxygen, 17 is magnesium, silicon, sulfur, nickel, calcium, aluminium, and 0.6% are the random elements, such as very exotic materials. Now, oh, as we can see here, various materials are found at different points. So at our surface, we have a large amount of oxygen, silicon, and aluminium. If you look at our planet's surface, we have a large amount of minerals and oxides that form, meaning that oxygen was present and it interacted with tons of materials to form metal and non-metal oxides. More towards the center, where iron isn't present, we have large amounts of unbonded iron and nickel that help form our molten core, which is really useful for us. Now, you might want to pause here and get this information now, because we have a fair bit here on our lithosphere, hydrosphere, and atmosphere. So we have the estimated mass and percentage of the Earth's mass, its average density, composition, temperature, pressure, breakdown, estimated dissolved materials. So I'll give you a minute to pause and get that down. All right. So... The Earth's structure. Due to the lack of direct access to our Earth's core, we're still 100%... Well, we're not exactly sure what happens. I mean, we have some very accurate theories, but no one actually been down there to test because of the inhospitality in the environment. So what we do know is often inferred due to careful observation and calculations. So, for instance, when an earthquake occurs, we know that there are two main stages, a primary wave and a secondary wave. There are other waves here, such as the Rayleigh wave and the Love wave, but the main two that people focus on the primary and secondary. So, the primary wave, or our P wave, is the mechanical compression wave, like how sound travels through something. And it travels through solids, liquids, and gases, and is often the first to be detected by a seismometer. So let's say we have a fault here at a hypercenter, slips, releases a shock wave. The P wave is going to travel a lot faster because it can travel through all forms of material at a relatively high speed. And as such, it's often the first to arrive. So when you have an earthquake, you might have a minor shock wave, that is the P wave passing through, that can be detected here. Now, afterwards, we have the S wave. Now, this is a mechanical transverse wave. So if the P wave is just compression and refraction like a sound wave, an S wave is like an actual wavelength of light. No, sorry, an actual wavelength of light going upwards and downwards. Now, because of this, it can only travel through solid matter. It won't work through liquid matter because underneath the planet's surface, there is no surface of the liquid. It's much like how if I have a can here and it was full directly to the brim exactly to the brim then naturally there can't be waves swimming because there's no room for the waves to form so our s wave travels along the planet's surface so let's see this piece of paper represents a planet's surface and it's naturally curved because our planet is a spherical shape or close to a spherical shape 
Now, as we know, the liquid could be directly underneath, so it goes in a straight line from here to here. Whereas the S wave has to go all the way through the top, so it has to go around the long way. Hence the reason it happens second. Now afterwards, we see what we call the surface waves. Think of these like the aftershocks. These are the things that cause massive structural damage to buildings and landscapes and everything else that's on the surface of the planet. Now as we can see down here, the Rayleigh wave happens more like a physical distortion. That's a, com a combination of P and S waves. So it goes in a circular fashion, almost like how you've twisted and warped a piece of very fragile wood. The love wave happens side to side as well. So almost like how if you're positioning something on the tray of a ute and you're driving down the highway, small imperfections cause it to wobble side to side. This is magnified for anything by you put on there and it sways side to side. Now, we know that there are various layers of our planet. So let's skip through here. Okay, so here we have the structure of our planet. So we have the crust that's on the top. Underneath that, we have the lithosphere, the asthenosphere, lower mantle, outer core, inner core. Now, between the lithosphere and the asthenosphere, it's not exactly a solid and it's not exactly liquid. It's some molten variation in between. And we call that the Mohorov. I'm going to butcher this, Mohorovich discontinuity, or the Moho. Now this is the point where the crust ends and the upper layer of the mantle begins, and it was detected by studying and interpreting the arrival waves of our primary waves, generated by earthquakes. So it's much like how, if I want to study the density of a material, but I can't you know, weigh it and calculate its volume and everything, I can t measure how long it takes energy to move through it and compare it against something that's known. For instance, you're at a sports carnival. Now, if you're at the other end of the finish line and you see the starting go, go off, what do you see first? Do you hear the sound or would you see the light coming from the combustion of the pistol? The answer would be the light because it travels faster. Now, imagine that 100 meter distance has a gas that's much, much thicker than normal air. You have the same starting gun going off. Now the light would still go through, but the sound wave of the sound of the starting pistol going off would be faster. The reason why is because sound has to vibrate against other particles. If the particles are closer together, then that means it's easier for sound to knock one into another. Now seismic tomography is a pre process used to map the various layers of the Earth. So people who want to study what the layers of the Earth are, they use this discipline. As P and S wave vibrations pass through the Earth, they curve outwards away from the core. This refraction of the waves is due to differing pressures of layers of the Earth itself. So if you remember, if you studied light in your junior years, refraction is how light can be bent. Like how if you put a straw into a glass of water, it seemingly shifts slightly or you can bend it like a funhouse mirror. Same thing's happening inside the core with our P and S waves. They're not going into the sensor directly, but most of them are branching away from it. Now, while vibrations can pass through the various layers of the Earth, they can be reflected or refracted due to the varying densities of the different levels. The denser the material, the faster the vibration speed. So if we're looking at this, we can see that most of them have been bent outwards already. And we have here our P waves managing to go through the liquid outer core and the solid inner core, because again, they're compression waves. Any S waves that were present just bounced off of it, or they went around it, if they could. Now, as a result, occasionally we have these areas here where it's been bent away entirely. We call those shadow zones. So let's say the epicenter happened here in Sydney, okay? Now, if we were to go to the other side of the planet here or here, so that might be, say, Johannesburg and Cairo, they would, or they wouldn't, without even the best equipment in the world, be able to detect a Sydney earthquake. Why? Because they're in the shadow zone. There's no direct contact with P waves or even S waves. They can't detect in any way, shape, or form. 
Now the Earth's core was calculated based on the shadow zones of the P waves, so it was pretty useful. Being a solid mass, it reflected S waves and heavily refracted P waves, as they were initially traveling through a liquid medium. Such intense pressures are known for compressing minerals into solids to reduce their volume. So even though the solid inner core may be made out of liquid, it's been compressed to the point at which it acts like a solid. Really interesting. All right, now the layers of our Earth. If you want, pause the video and get this information down. So here we have the layers of the Earth along with their states, thickness, and approximate temperatures. And as we know, the temperature increases with each layer as well as its density. So the hottest, densest area will be our inner core. But as we go out, it gets cooler, it gets looser, and it starts moving around quite a fair bit. Now, a rock density prac is relatively simple. In your classroom, you should have a variety of rocks to choose from. You pick one, you weigh it, record its weight. Then you get a large beaker, let's say, I don't know, an 800 mil or 500 mil beaker, it depends on the size of your rock. You fill it to a set amount with water. Then you are going to place the rock in there. See how much the water level changes. Alternatively, you can put the rock in first and then take the rock out after it's been filled with water, but you take water with you when you go. The other way, rock, rock after the water is much more accurate. Now, calculating density is a relatively simple act. In fact, it's been done for thousands of years. As we can see here, Archimedes was called by a king who thought that his goldsmith who made his crown was actually ripping him off. He thought that the crown felt a little bit different. And he told Archimedes, I want you to prove to me for a fact that this is made of 100% pure gold. Archimedes rolled up his sleeves, said, no worries, mate. I'm just going to need a large volume of water. I'm going to need a set of scales. I'm going to need the original mass of gold you gave the goldsmith. Don't worry. I'm going to return it. And from there, he calculated the density of the original mass, the gold ingots that the goldsmith was given. Then he gave the gold back repeat the same experiment with the crown. Now seeing as both objects were made out of the same mass of gold, they should have had the same density. They actually didn't. It actually had a large mass of lead being mixed into it. So it might have looked like gold, it might have felt like gold, but it was not the same density as gold. And as a result, Archimedes was hailed a hero, the goldsmith was executed, the king got a proper crown made. Everyone was happy, except the goldsmith. All right, now, for a very long time, people questioned about how old our planet actually was. Now, originally, people based it on something arbitrary like the Bible. They said, okay, the average lifespan is this person. They claimed this many people existed. Hence, no one existed before then, so the Earth must be so many years old. But over time, people began to question it with a little bit more empirical thought in mind. They thought, okay, that's just one thing. Let's test it for ourselves. Let's go out into nature and actually find something that's really old and date it. So here, they've used various meteorite samples and zircon crystals to be able to accurately date our planet to be around 4.56 billion years old. Now, they used two different types of meteorites, stony meteorites, and iron meteorites. The earliest forms of meteorites that humans had access to had large amounts of iron in them. So as such, they started to forge them into stuff they thought was useful, like shields and swords and spears and arrows and such. In fact, many of the old legends about, you know, magic swords were just people who were fighting against someone who had an iron sword when they were equipped with bronze. Bronze being a weaker metal, it gave way to iron very easily. Now, iron meteorites and stony iron meteorites were believed to have formed alongside the achondritic meteorites, due to the presence of metals such as iron as other planetesimals collide and disintegrate with each other. Iron was actually formed in a supernova several billion years before the Earth formed, and when they were scattered outwards into the rest of the galaxy, many of them actually landed here. Now, stony meteorites, which is a large number of them, are separated into chondritic and achondritic. Now, chondritic means they possess round globules of silicates, 
or chondrules. So essentially it's like a small glass bead that's formed within it. They cooled upon molten state in space. So they were superheated when they kicked out of wherever they came from. When they got into space, which is very cold, they froze into a perfect sphere. And they're estimated to be 4.57 billion years old. Now it makes up around about 86% of stony meteorites and is one of the oldest forms of meteorite evidence ever found. Now it stands to reason if we dug even deeper we might find older stuff there but at this point this is the oldest evidence we've found. Achondritic means that it lacks these globules of silicate and it possesses textures similar to basalt. Now the iron meteorites and stony iron meteorites formed along the same times as these ones so chondritic material formed first then achondritic and then iron meteorites. Our zircon crystals are considered to be some of the oldest crystalline materials ever found. Evidence being found in sedimentary crystals found in WA estimated to be 4.4 billion years old. Zircon crystals are in fact a lovely color however they're believed to have small portions of uranium in them. So here we have the asteroid and meteorite types. A rubble pile was the original mass of material that was floating around in space. Chondrites with, and chondritic meteorites were found there. Over time, iron meteorites started hitting them, forming outer layers, then achondritic meteorites and stony meteorites. All right, now, all of this classification of different materials is based only on a Western perspective. But different cultures would have different methods of classifying materials based on what was important to them. For instance, were I to look at Aboriginal cultures here in Australia, there were one point over at least 200 different nations and all of them had a very ecologically sound method of working with our country. They never over exhausted resources. If they got close they moved on to another location leaving the former one to regrow and re recover essentially. Alas they still needed access to materials so they still needed stoneware. So here we have an example of what we call a stone flake. Stone flake was any stone that could be sharpened to a point. So for instance, spear and arrow tips or knives, axes, they're all very, very useful. And it used a process called napping. So essentially we have one stone that we call a hammer stone and we have a stone flake and you simply beat it until stone slivers came off until it had a nice sharpened edge. Now, Aboriginal culture and knowledge of geology was based around their uses. Could the stone be used to hammer other materials into shape? Could it be used to make a stone flake? Could it be used to be ground into a paste to be used to apply as like paint or something? Now, one material that became very important was ochre. Ochre is a soil mixture primarily made out of ferric oxide and sand and clay, and it was used to making paint for various ceremonies. So if I go a little bit further, where are we hiding? Oh, here we are. When they were mining for materials, they might have focused primarily on looking for different types. So there's white ochre, red ochre, and yellow. Each one has a varying degree of different minerals inside of it to give it a different color. And each one was used for specific purposes. So it might have been one might have been used for face painting, another might be used for making murals on walls, another one might have been used to help with marking particular weapons or tools or clothing. If we go back, where were we up to? All right, now, in Western culture, we tend to separate these materials into felsic and mesic. Where's my, there we are. Okay, so, to separate them, first we go into whether they are silicates or non-silicates. So a silicate, are primarily composed of silica or oxygen, so silicon and oxygen based in tetrahedrons. It's a particular shape, look it up. They're linked together in different ways. So from here, mafic has large amounts of magnesium and iron in it, giving a very dark color. It is a very high density and it has to crystallize at temperatures that are very, very large. For instance, basalt is formed in very hot temperatures. Felsic are composed of primary silicon and aluminium, and you also have large amounts of potassium in there. 
It has a very light coloring and has a density on average of less than three grams per centimeter cubed. So for instance, quartz, muscovite, mica, that kind of stuff. Non-silicates do not possess this silica oxygen tetrahedron, but instead they might have economic significance, so they might be worth a lot of money. For instance, carbonates that are very widely spread, they're mostly sedimentary and igneous. For instance, calcite, you might know it as chalk. Sulfide are often bonded to metals. So it might have a metal bonded with a sulfite ion, for instance, cinnabar, very useful material. In fact, it was worth more than gold at some points in human history because it contained mercury, which was used to helping shape clothing or make thermometers or you know, poison people, as you do. This table here on the right, or this graph on the right-hand side is also very useful. So here we have felsic, intermediate, mafic, ultramafic. And as we can see here, the amount of different minerals inside each one shifts depending upon which type of classification it is. So the silica content will go down as well as sodium potassium content. However, the temperature that it starts melting at is often correlated to the iron, magnesium, calcium content. So the more iron or magnesium it has in it, the hotter it needs to, needs to melt. All right. To classify rocks, we use physical and chemical properties. A physical property is a trait that the object has on its own without interacting with any other form of matter. So say for instance, I have, oh, it was a piece of metal or something. No, that's with it. This pen. This pen on its own has various physical properties. For instance, its weight. I can weigh this. I don't need to add it to acid in order to see how much it weighs. It has a set volume. It has a set level of rigidity or hardness. It has a set conductivity. It has a set color. Okay. Now, if I were to pop this into a beaker of acid, it would display its chemical properties, which is it has to interact with another form of material. An easy way to visualize this is think about someone that you know. Now, on their own, this person might act in a certain way. They might be very loud, they might be very boisterous, they might be over the top. However, if you have them around particular people, they become very quiet, they become very sullen, they become very subdued. For instance, it might be your younger brother or sister who is always annoying, or it might be an older sibling that's always patronizing. As soon as your parents walk into the room, they change their tune. So here we have some physical properties we often use. The crystal form, so how a crystal lattice is formed, for instance, comparing graphite to diamond, same element, but just connected differently. Its hardness, so you'd have to use a Mohs hardness test to test this. The cleavage or fracture, so it's how often you have breaks occurring in a shear surface. The specific gravity, you know, how much does it weigh in relation to, you know, how dense it is. <sighs> it's luster, it's ability to shine after being polished. It's color and streak, so whether if you make a scratch on it, does it make it shinier or does it make it worse? And there are other properties such as magnesium and examination on a polarized light. Chemical properties, there are a lot fewer of them. One might be radioactivity, another one might be acid reactivity. Well, I want to be flammability, but we don't tend to test flammability with these sort of materials. Unless you're looking at fossil fuels. On the right there, we have more physical properties if you're interested. Now, a dichotomous key is a very easy way of classifying rocks based on what they have and what they don't. So, to identify rocks, we tend to use the graph that's on the right-hand side. If you want, pause the video and get a copy of it. So, minerals naturally occurring in organic solids with a defined crystalline structure and composition differ in their composition and crystal structure. They are often composed of metal and non-metal lattice. So, for instance, table salt is made out of sodium and chlorine. Chlorine is non-metal, sodium is metal, and they alternate 
in a checkerboard style pattern throughout an entire crystal lattice. Now the physical properties of a mineral are often determined by its composition and structure. So like the ones we looked at in the last slide. However, if the physical conditions around a mineral change, for instance, if I increase or decrease temperature or pressure, then the physical traits of the mineral can change as well, despite being stable in form. So it's much like how if I superheated a piece of metal in metalwork and I curved it around and I was using it to make a candelabra or something, then I rapidly cool it down, I have changed the shape of this material. If I kept doing this, heating and cooling it, I would have made it more brittle as well. So that's just an example. <sighs> All right, the rock cycle. So, the rock cycle is particularly useful here because we understand how rocks are formed and we understand how they can be unformed. So we have three types here would have looked at in primary school or in junior school. Igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. We can see them here. So an igneous rock is formed from a cool cooling of magma or lava. So remember, lava is only formed when magma goes to the surface. If it's still underneath the surface, it's magma. Now often we call some of these plutonic rocks, which means they're still formed underneath the surface and cooled very slowly over a long period of time. It's much like how if you cook something in the oven and you leave it in there, okay? You don't take it out of the oven to put it on the bench and let it cool down rapidly. You leave it in the oven and it stays warm for a very, very long time. So the color, crystal presence, and size can aid in classifying them into subcategories, such as plutonic, which is subterranean formation, volcanic, which is surface formation, vesicular, which is porous, Felsic, mafic, etc. So porous rocks are actually quite cool because there's only one type of rock that we know of that floats on water. Pumice stone, which is a perfect example of a vesicular rock that forms towards the surface. Sedimentary rocks are a bit different. Sedimentary rocks form by layer upon layer of dirt or soil that's been compressed. Most of these rocks happen in areas where there's been large amounts of tidal or water activity over a long stretches of time. For instance, here in the Riverina, we have a large amount of sedimentary rock because the Murrumbidgee River has shifted constantly over hundreds of thousands of millions of years. Now some of these subcategories include clastic, which is fragments of rock and mineral that have been put together, like shale. Chemical, which is chemical precipitation, includes stuff like limestone, which was chemically dissolved then reformed somewhere else. And then it's organic, for instance, coal. So say we had a large leafy green area several million years ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth, and we had a stegosaurus, fell over, died. Over time, if it was inside a swampy area, it would get sunk into the swamp and you know get coated with other forms of vegetation and biological refuse. But then over time, more material would fall on top of that and more material on top of that, and so on and so forth, until it's buried hundreds of meters under the ground. Now, this takes a very long time, and as such, it's going to be chemically diffused with other materials around it, so it's going to change its biological and chemical composition until it's no longer a living thing or even a dead thing. It's now a non-alive thing. It's now fossil fuels. Metamorphic rock are what happens when you have either igneous or sedimentary and they've been warped by temperature or pressure or extremely long periods of time. Here we have areas undergoing fol foliation where they've been folded on top of one another. So it could have been a slow moving occurrence. It could have been something occurring relatively rapidly in terms of geology. Now these three form what we call our rock cycle. Now, our rock cycle here looks a little bit complicated, but there's an easy way to help you remember it. So, let's see. Um, so, let's say we're starting at magma. And it suddenly undergoes solidification. 
So it might just be cooling down. So it goes from there to igneous. If we were to go the other way, it means it's being melted. So that could be due to volcanic activity in an area. Don't mind me. Please ensure if you copy this as well. Now from igneous, it can be affected metamorphically. Or it can be eroded to create what we call sediment. Now, every other type of rock can be eroded. There's no way around that. Now, let's say you have your sediment, and it wants to turn into a sedimentary rock. It has to undergo lithification. Now, lithos means, you know, rock or soil, so it's changing into a stone. Now, sedimentary rock can undergo metamorphism as well. And then from metamorphic rock, it too can be melted back into magma. And from here, we have Miss M, our mnemonic to help us remember the rock cycle. Now, naturally, you can alter this however you want. All right, if you need to, I'll hold it up again so you can get a copy of it. Press the video's pause button if you'd like. But ultimately, it comes down to how you choose to remember things. Oops, what have I done there? Oh, that's a little bit better here. So this is partially what some kids, you know, jot down on their exam paper when they're about to go in for it. That's pretty cool. I learned a new function on this thing. All right, let's change it back. Yo, right oh. All right, let's move on to the next one. Soil formation. So for the most part, our planet is a marvel because it's considered to be the only planet that has, as we know, life. A main contributor to this is an unsung hero, soil. Now, the region that our planet's has soil in it is often referred to as regolith. Mars has regolith, but it's different to ours. If ours were to be a smoothed over piece of soil based material as a regolith, Mars is spiny because it hasn't been weathered down by water or as much air as ours. Were you to inhale Earth dust, well, you know, it'd be unpleasant, but you'd be alive. Unhale Martian regolith you'd probably be bleeding inside your lungs within a few minutes. Now, soil is in fact made up of a lot of different things. It's 45% minerals, but the rest of it, 5% organic matter can include small amounts of root activity from plants or fungi, 25% water, 25% air. If you ever tried to grow in a plant and you overwatered it, you've changed the soil composition by pushing out most of the air. Plant can't breathe, it dies. Our mineral material is derived from parent material. So the original rock that wore away to make this, that rock was made out of certain elements and compounds, hence this mineral was made out of certain elements and compounds. Porosity of the soil ranges around 10 to 70%, and that can determine how well a soil drains. Now, this might be based on how much air and water is already present. This in turn gives rise to terms like clay, loam, and sand which you're going to be doing as a practical with your teacher, obviously, and a soil texture triangle. Now, for the most part, soil tends to clump together into you know, dirt clods that are technically called peds. Now, there are different types of peds that can form, and however big they are can determine how much space roots have in order to move. So let's say, go to the next one. If you're looking down here at the very bottom on the left-hand side, where we have single grain or massive, a massive ped is made out of primarily clay and it's all one large mass. The permeability and aeration is very small because there's not a lot of avenues, avenues for them to move through. Consider a ped like a block of land. Now, if you're in a city and it covers hundreds of thousands of blocks of land, you need space to be able to move between them. 
if you lived in the center of the CBD, Sydney, and there were no roads, no footpaths, no spaces at all between buildings, how would you get out? How would you move around? You can't. Same thing's happening here. So for the most part, at our school, for instance, we have primarily blocky pads or platy pads. <clears throat> now, for the most part, these different types of pads and soil structure are based on what sort of elements are holding them together. So we you tend to use what we call a soil formation triangle here, or soil density triangle, in order to determine what the mixture is. So, for instance, our school has clay loam, or somewhere in this particular region here where the cursor is. Now, this means that while it has a large amount of clay that can hold together, it can be vulnerable to overwatering to the point of oversaturation. You do that, the water doesn't go anywhere, it pulls, it kills off plants, they rot. However, it's very advantageous during the summer because if we do water it small amounts regularly, then it's going to retain most of that water. It's not going to be lost due to evaporation. So plants can still survive. If you need to, get all this information down, okay? And have a crack at performing a soil texture analysis in your backyard. I guarantee you, you won't regret it. All right, now, let's say you have your little cousin or whatever, and they're very annoying. You get frustrated with them to the point of which you say, here, have a shovel, go outside and dig a hole. Now your cousin, being the very thorough person that they are, dug a hole around about one meter deep. Throughout that one meter, you would see the soil has changed. So up the top, Australia has a very thin O horizon. We have these layers called horizons here. The O horizon is made out of decomposing matter. So for instance, any sort of twigs or branches or leaf matter or dead grass has just fallen onto the surface and it's been compressed down. In most of Australia, we don't have a lot of organic matter to have that happen. So it's very thin or it doesn't happen at all. It mainly happens during, say, areas where there's a lot of vegetation. So if you went to northern Queensland, up to you know the rainforest up there, you definitely have a large amount of O horizon. The A horizon is very valuable to farmers. It's the topsoil. Mostly minerals from parent material with organic matter incorporated, a good material for plants and other organisms to live. Any farmer that complains about losing topsoil has lost lost all of these important minerals. Okay, it's lost a lot of that organic matter which will help their crops grow. Beneath that, we have the E horizon, the alluviated. Essentially, it's leached of clay, minerals, and organic matter, leaving a concentration of sand and silt particles of quartz or other resistant materials. It's missing in some soils, but found in older soils and forest soils. So essentially, it had it. It had all the minerals. It had a lot of water, but it just got leached out over time because it couldn't hold on to them. Beneath that, the B horizon, this is where all of it's moved to, and it's very rich in minerals. So if a plant's growing down, it's like, oh, the O horizon, yay, cool. A horizon, fantastic. E horizon, meh. B horizon, hell yeah. Okay. Now beneath that, we have the C horizon, which is the original parent material. So it's a mixture of rocks and small amounts of soil that's constantly being broken down. And it's been partially altered. All right, but beneath that, we have the bedrock. So this is something that hasn't yet been eroded, hasn't been touched yet. So it's a similar chemical composition to the parent material, but it's mainly intact. Groundwater can often be formed in between the C horizon and the R horizon because the water can't sink any lower than that. If you hear about the water table being altered, that means the water at that depth has been severely drained or it's been overfilled which can be a problem, believe me. All right. Relative and absolute dating are two distinct methodologies. Relative dating is simply estimating how old something is by comparing it to the age of something else and where it's located. So for instance, you have your laundry hamper. Now, your laundry generally goes in the washing machine on Saturday morning. Stands to the reason that the oldest clothes you would have in there 
would be from Sunday, from the previous week. All right. Now, if that's the case, every layer that's built on top of that would be the subsequent day. So if I went just above the clothes you wore on Sunday, I'd expect to see Monday clothes. I go above that, I expect to see Tuesday clothes. This is part of what we call the laws of stratigraphy. And you can see them here. First one, law of superposition. The younger layers of rock sit atop older layers. Older stuff's found at the bottom and it gets younger as you go up. The law of original horizontality. Layers of sedentary rock are originally deposited flat. If it makes sense, okay? It's not like they're automatically going to form at an angle. That happens due to physical distortions due to geological activity over time. It could be rivers wearing away at some part, or it could be a landslide in another. But originally, we assume they're always going to fall flat on the ground. The three, law of cross-cutting relationships. Rock layers A and B must be older than the intrusion that disturbs them. You can't cut into a cake if you haven't made the cake yet. Just so, layer C cannot cut into layers A and B unless A and B are already there. Okay. And finally, rule four, the law of lateral continuity. Layers of rocks are continuous until they encounter other solid bodies that block their deposition or until they're acted upon by outside agents that appeared after their position took place. So, that rock layer is going to continue until something's interrupted it. It could be another rock intruding its space, it could be a force has removed it. But these four are really important when we're assuming the age of a relative object. So, if I found a fossil in layer A here, and I found another fossil in layer B, and I found another fossil in layer B. That third fossil that I found, if it's at the exact same depth as the second one, and both of them are found in layer B, I can assume that they're roughly the same age. I can also assume that they're both older than layer A. Alright. Now, absolute dating is a bit different. Absolute dating requires us to use radiological methods in order to ascertain the exact date something was formed. So let's say we're looking at the formation of rock here. Now this rock has a large amount of a potassium ion, potassium 40. Now potassium 40 is relatively unstable. Eventually it will use its half-life, so it will begin to break down into a smaller, more stable element. If you study radiation in junior years, this is where you use it. So it's going to form into argon, which, you know, isn't exactly a solid matter, but it will bond with stuff that might be solid, or we can date it. So as we can see here, it's gradually changing from green to yellow. How much? If you count them the green dots here, and then counted them here, you notice that half of them are gone. If you went from this one, to the third, half are gone again. And from here, or to the very end, approximately half again. A half-life is how long it takes for half of the radioactive potential to be lost from a given substance. So, what do you notice about the dates up here when it's measured? That's right. Every 1.25 billion years, approximately half of potassium-40 has been lost. It's decayed into a more stable argon-40. So its half-life is 1.25 billion years. Some of them are older, some of them are longer, some of them are much shorter, but it's very useful. Now we can do a similar thing with zircon crystals. So a molten rock has a mixture of lead and uranium inside of it. We can see Pb meaning lead, U meaning uranium. Now the zircon crystal forms incorporation uranium but not lead. Okay, so essentially, essentially this crystal is formed with only uranium inside of it. The lead might have been pushed out. Now uranium becomes in the zircon converts to lead on a predictable rate 
portion of uranium to to lead reveals age of zircon. So essentially, this zircon crystal is like the oldest hourglass that we know of on Earth. When it's first formed, it's pushed out any form of lead inside of it, so it only has uranium in there. Now over time, that uranium that's frozen in place is slowly going to decay and form into lead. Now as such, if we know the rate that uranium decays, and we can find out how much uranium is still left in there, we can work out how long it's been since it was first formed. All right. Now, to do this, occasionally we're going to have to use what's known as a mass spectroscopy mass spectrometer. I have great difficulty with words. I'm so sorry. A mass spectrometer is essentially a machine that breaks down and identifies unique elements based on their magnetism. So I have vaporized a sample and I've injected the sample in here and it's going along an electron beam. So essentially it's been ionized, which means it's been superheated to the point it's hotter than a gas and it's been ripped apart and shot around this bend. Now, this gray area is essentially a giant magnet. Each element responds to electromagnetic energy, including certain forms of magnetism. So, if it's lighter, it's going to be curved around more. If it's heavier, it's going to be curved around less, depending upon its atomic mass. So, essentially, it's much like how if you were to throw someone's backpack if you were to you know, grab a bag and start swinging it around and eventually let it go and it was empty, you're going to send that thing flying. If it was full to the brim with lots of heavy objects and you picked up and you swung it around, it's not going to go very far because you don't have enough energy to make it go. All right. Now, for a long time, we started coalescing all of our information to create a geological time scale which is located here on the right. So here we can see what's known as the or oh, a progression here. So originally we have the Precambrian period and the Phanerozoic or up here, these were called eons. Next to that we have eras that break them down, then periods that break them down further, and then finally millions of years. Okay? It's much like how we're not going to count how many seconds you've been alive for. We count how many years you've been alive. Okay, if you're a little kid, you're very proud of the fact you're two and a half or five and a half or whatever. But when you're my age, nearly 33 years old, I don't care how many months or old I am. All right. Now, as such, we also have what's known as the law of faunal succession. Fossils succeed each other vertically in a specific, reliable order, very similar to the law of superposition. Fossils appear at a particular level in a sequence and can be identified over large horizontal distances. So if I dug down 20 meters and I found a particular shaped cell, I went, you know, 100 k's that way, dug down 20 meters and found another similarly shaped skull and they're identical, I'm going to assume they're the same species. Okay, because they're found in the same geological time period, they're the same shape, you get it. Now fossils disappear at a particular level in sequence above the level where they appeared. The disappearance level can also be identified over large horizontal distances. So where they appeared is the first evidence that this species actually exists. Where they stop is where we assume they go extinct. Okay, not every species survives. Once the fossil disappears from a sequence, it never reappears. So if I went to an area and I dug straight down and I found a pinky toe from a T-Rex, all right. Now, if it stands to reason it's below the area where the Cretaceous period ends, where dinosaurs ended, that's okay, because dinosaurs were thought to exist during that period. If I found one above the line where the Cretaceous period ends, and there was no other dinosaur remains after that, I'm going to be very concerned, because A, a dinosaur can't spontaneously come back after being extinct for a couple of million years. It just can't. It's like someone came back from the dead now. I mean, it makes no sense. So it stands to reason that unless there was some geological shift that caused one area to be pushed up further, then it 
it's either a hoax or we have something new to learn. All right, the Aboriginal mining we talked about earlier. Non-renewable prospecting. Now, for the most part, mining is a non-renewable source of materials. By that, I mean we can't grow new materials. Some people say, you know, we'll, we'll make new fossils. Do you have a couple of hundred million years up your sleeve? No. So as such, anything we take out of the ground, we're never going to get back. So it's important that we try to either cut down how much we take out of the ground or we heavily recycle what we've already taken. So by here, short, medium term, we're talking about geological terms. Okay, we're not talking about a human term. There's no way you could fossilize material in someone's lifespan. You know, not unless you're an immortal or a vampire or Walt Disney or something. All right. A mineral occurs as a solid on the Earth's surface. It's non-organic. It occurs naturally. It possesses distinct chemical composition and across... Yep. Okay. For the most part, when we talk about economically significant materials or minerals, we're talking about stuff that you can actually make money out of. I go outside and I dig up a piece of concrete. Yes, it's a mineral, but it's not... I can't resell that for a couple of million dollars. So instead we focus on stuff like fossil fuels and mineral ores. Fossil fuels such as oil, coal, and gas are very valuable to us at the present because we use them for a lot of stuff. Half the stuff that's sitting on my desk has a plastic coating. Plastics are derived from fossil fuels. Same with the electricity that's used to power this workstation. It's primarily derived from coal-fired power stations. Okay? Metal ores such as magnetite, gold, bauxite, and other metal sulfides are very significant for us. Okay, Gold doesn't actually form an ore as such because it's very non-reactive, so you tend to find gold as it is in nature. Magnetite and bauxite are aluminium and iron that have been bonded with other materials like oxygen. And metal sulfides, like cinnabar, really useful. Economically significant non-metal ores include stuff like limestone and sandstone that are used for construction purposes, and diamonds, which are used for either making into you know, diamond-tipped tools, or for jewellery or high-precision prisms. Now, there is a very strong relationship between where you find a certain mineral and what type of mineral it is. So, say for instance, I want to find basalt. I would find that near an area where there's been a large amount of volcanic activity. I would look directly below me because I wouldn't expect it to be you know, shot out of a volcano. It would have been deposited underground. It's a plutonic based material. So if you know what to look for on the surface, you can often find what you're looking for underneath. Now Australia is really big on non-renewable resources. As you can see here in this picture, every one of those dots indicates an area where something has either been mined where it's been, well, they know where there's a deposit or where it's been processed into a useful material. Now, as such, over 50% of Australia's total export earnings is based on non renewable materials, particularly anything that comes from the mining boom. Now, I've been told that the mining boom is eventually going to end, and that makes sense. I mean, you're eventually going to run out of resources. So, everything that we have here in this map, which is taken from 2016, some of these mines might be shut down, others might have been cropped up, some might have been moved. But we have to be careful because eventually we will run out of materials and we have to be able to substitute them with some other form of industry. Okay, as we can see here, a lot of people heavily rely on the mining industry, including not just people who directly work in the mines, but people who work in the processing plants, people who are responsible for finding some of these places or managing in a head office. We're looking for people who work as distributors for the various materials. People work in advertising. People work in anything else involved in the industry, as well as any local communities that are formed by the mining industry. So you might have a mine located out in Whoop Whoop. Now, nearby where most of the miners live and work, a small town might form. If that mine closes shop, that community suffers. So while it's important, it's essentially important we don't become even more reliant on it because if it stops where does that leave us now we know that Australia is rich in minerals but Australia is really large we have to be able to find them so we use two different methods one is what we call remote sensing 
whereby we scan a very large area for any signs of something that we recognize being associated with a particular mineral. So say for instance, we want to scan all of Australia to find a new diamond mine. Okay, diamonds might be located under any area that has particular land formation. So using satellite imagery and whatnot, we scan the whole country for anywhere that has those particular shaped hills or ravines or whatever. Then from there, we look for whether or not there are other minerals present. Say diamonds only form near areas that have very low magnetic and electrical conductivity. We scan those areas we looked for before and we isolate the ones that have very low magnetic and electrical conductivity. We get rid of the rest. So it's a process of deduction. Now from there, we would send out a prospector or you know a geological engineer. They would go out and they would start what we call our direct sampling, which essentially they do chemical sampling of the area around them. Now in the old days, they had to go out and they had to put in stakes and everything else to isolate. Okay, I took the sample from this location. I'll go back to head office, do the chemical testing. I'll come back later if it comes, you know, works out well. Nowadays, we have field kits that can do it for us. And we also have data that can be uploaded directly to the internet, as well as GPS. So we're saving a lot of time and money by digitizing and working smarter rather than harder. All right. Now let's say the geologist or our prospector has found something. They want to start mining immediately. Depending on what you found and the area around you, you're going to use different methods to mine. So for instance, let's say you found coal. Okay. If he was looking for diamonds, but he found coal, he'd still be pretty happy because he can sell that information. Open pit mining is really useful because it's excavation and ground level and it's cutting out material as you need to. Now it also means you're preventing digging tunnels on the ground and that totally eliminates the risk of cave-ins. It looks a little bit like this image. So they start with drilling and then they plant explosives, they load up the material and they haul it out and they crush it. And they continually do this again and again and again and again. And it almost forms like a drill bit in the ground, a giant drill bit. Now, underground mining has one advantage that open pit doesn't. While it does cost more and there is a higher risk of, say, cave-ins and whatnot, you don't have to waste as much money hauling out waste rock or garge. Okay? You're only cutting into rock that you need to. And you're preserving to a greater degree, the ecosystem that's on the top level. Okay, you're just digging underneath it, grabbing what you need and getting out. Now, depending upon how the ore is formed, whether it's horizontal or vertical, you use different cutting methods. It's much like if you're in woodwork, you cut with the grain. If you cut against it, you're more likely to have splitting. Okay, so for here, we have a horizontal ore body and we have two methods available to us. Okay, we have room and pillar and long wall. So, room and pillar is essentially where you're excavating a large room, for better words, and you're leaving behind pillars of ore body to serve as your structural beams to hold the ceiling up. Often they're reinforced with steel and everything else, but in essence, you're just cutting out what you need and you're leaving. Long wall is a bit different, where you have a wall up to around about 350 meters long, and you're shearing away four meters at a time into it. So one of them is much like hollowing it out like a termite would. The other one is wearing away one particular wall. Then you're collapsing it back on purpose to make sure it doesn't you know, cave in completely. Or essentially you finish with it. You can't get any more material out. Vertical ore bodies are different. So we have open stoping, which is a bore that's made in the ore and it's blasted away. The broken ore is removed. The intact areas are deemed to be strong. And as such, they serve as an area to hold up the ceiling again. This one has to be done very carefully. Reckless mining can actually cause structural instabilities, which could cause the entire network to collapse upon itself, or particular areas of tunnels. So with open stoping, they have to do the calculations very carefully and know what's on the other side. If they hit a structural you know, vulnerability, they could kill a lot of people. Cut and fill is different. Now this requires a vertical ore body with a very low strength, so it's 
easy to break away. The ore is removed in slices and the garnish is backfilled. So they've sliced away the wall, but take it with them up to the surface, they extract what they need to, what's left over, they take that back down, pump it in like cement, wait until it's solidified, and they use that as a floor to continue digging in. Now finally, we have drilling. Drilling is defined only by where it occurs. It's either onshore or offshore. So here, we have a comparison between the two. So if you can't read that, let's have a look. Oil drilling or offshore drilling only takes place in the shore in ocean waters. It's 30% of worldwide production. Okay, so it's not a great deal. Now, deep water drilling typically occurs in ranges from 400 to 1,500 meters deep. So this is continental shelf level. Ultra deep water drilling wow, occurs at depths of up to 3,000 meters. So that's way off the coast. Now, onshore is probably a bit safer. It encompasses all drilling sites located on dry land. It makes up 70% of worldwide distribution and requires a drilling of deep holes down to the earth's surface to reach the soil below. Now, drilling an offshore is an offshore well is like the onshore drilling process. So essentially what they do, as they drill down, they pipe it as they go. So let's say you drill down 20, 20 meters, okay? You would send down a, a, a pipe and you'd weld that in. You'd make sure that it was able to resist any pressure from the surrounding material around it. And then you continue drilling and you continually add pipe as you go. So essentially how they get it back up is they use pressure. So if we're looking at onshore, it's drilled and piped until it reaches the ore. The low pressure at the surface creates a vacuum so the ore, whether it's gas or oil, will naturally want to go up towards the surface where it's lower pressure and they maintain that vacuum. By maintaining the vacuum, they can continue pumping. So if you've ever seen old movies where they're looking at an oil drill and suddenly starts spurting out oil at the top, it means they've struck oil, which is you know great for them because they're going to get paid buku bucks. All right, so that's the end of our video. Okay, I know it's been quite a while, but what I would like you to do is if you've had a look over this material and you feel confident with it, or you want to test yourself, have a crack at these four questions. If you want to get feedback on these four questions, go in and see your earth science teacher and they'll be able to help you out. So, question one, how do the composition layers of the earth develop? What are the components of rocks and soil? How is the age of geological materials determined? How are non-renewable geological resources discovered and extracted? Using these four questions, what I would advise you to do is take a full page and use that to create for you a cheat sheet. Okay, get down as much information as you can, whether it's diagrams, whether it's bullet points, whether you want to try writing it as an actual report. Okay, make sure you get as much of it as you can, and then, you know, talk to your friends, talk to your teacher, talk to your classmates about it, and see how much material they feel they can add or that you feel that you can teach them. As always, I've been Fori. You guys have been amazing. I'll see you around.